Well, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now, we've spent a few weeks in this chapter now. We've been looking at the distinction between uh, someone who is foolish and someone who is wise. And obviously, we want to be uh, an example of someone who is wise. Well, now, we discussed um, last week that living wisely is immensely important. The Christian is called to live wisely, and it makes a dramatic impact to our well-being and our quality of life. Moreover, and most importantly, living wisely honors and pleases God. It is the way that we can live that is the most purest expression of, of worship, to live wisely for Him. Uh, Our attention last week was drawn towards that relationship between walking in the Spirit and walking in wisdom. These are inseparable. If you want to walk in wisdom, if you want to live wisely, you need to be walking in the Spirit. And although this is a broad topic, we did reduce it to walking in obedience to God's Word. If your life is captured or commandeered by Scripture, then you will be walking in the Spirit and you will be living wisely. And so as we continue in chapter 10, Solomon's going to highlight the criticality of living wisely. So let's just pick this up in verse 12. We're going to hit three verses today. So we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 12. Solomon says, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no one knows what he is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know way, does not know the way to the city. Okay, let's pause here. Uh, last week I mentioned that one of the most um, prominent or significant ways that we can walk in wisdom is through our decision making. Uh, wisdom is generally expressed in the decisions that we make. Right, we come to a fork in the road. There's a foolish way to do things in a wise way, right? So we make choices, decision-making. So in this text this morning, Solomon is going to identify the other domain by which we express wisdom, and that is the words that we speak. The, over, the overriding truth in this, the verses that we just read is that the fool, he does not measure his words. So Solomon points out that there are consequences for that. Now, he doesn't specifically um, describe the content of a full speech. He just gives a general characterization of the way that fools talk. The fool, he just blurts stuff out. Uh, He doesn't really consider the impact of his words or whether he's hurting people. Uh, It even says in verse 12, but the lips of a fool consume him. So in the end, the fool himself, he's the one who's hurting the most. Doesn't make sense what he says. The more he talks, the more ridiculous it becomes. He's full of words, multiple of words. If he didn't say anything, that's the fool. That's the content of his tongue. He boasts about the future, yet he can't even find his way to the city. They say in biblical times... um, the, the roads to the cities were really well marked because of travelers. This is a way that people could find their way to get from one place to the other. And, and he makes a point here that this guy, he's so busy talking, so busy talking, he can't even find his way to the city. Well, one commentator suggests that that was like a, a saying back then and, uh, to describe a stupid person. Um, that person, he can't even find his way to the city. Right? It's kind of like we, we might say, That guy, I don't even know if this is a saying, actually, but uh, that guy can't find his way out of a paper bag, right? Is that a saying? It's good. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. (laughs) And so nothing reveals more about a person 
You, you know a person by the stuff that comes out of their mouth. And so we're going to be talking about that this morning, which means this, this is one of those topics that can really do a good system upgrade on all of us, right? We all need a good firmware upgrade, uh, update to correct some things. And when, we're, when we address or, and when we're challenged about taming the tongue, that is one of the most useful things we, we can um, consider to see some immediate growth in our life. Now, obviously, God has made us uh, expressive beings, and, and, and words, our language, how we talk, that's, that's, how, that's how we convey what we think and how we feel. And, but the Bible instructs us that we have to control that. And the reason why we have to control that is because the words, the things you say can be incredibly destructive. Which leads to my first point for us this morning is that the power of life and death is in the tongue. The tongue it might be very small. Oh, but it's powerful. In Proverbs 8, 21, you know, Solomon says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. This just this highlights or emphasizes the, the, the huge impact that what, what your words can make. And Jesus says in uh, Matthew 12, he says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Like it really does matter what you say. And we're responsible for what we say. We're not awesome at taking responsibility for the things we say, but the things that come out of your mouth have massive impact. You may want to keep track of that. You may want to make a little bit of an effort for the, to, to regulate the things that come out of your mouth. So let's begin by just looking at the destructive nature of words. Words can be destructive. I think we know this. Now, when we were kids, I assume you had the saying here in America, um, when you are criticized or someone calls you names, we would sing a song back to them, would say, what, sticks and stones may break my bones, right? But words will never hurt me. Do you guys sing that here? Uh, that's not even remotely true. Of course words can hurt you. I, I would suggest that sticks and stones actually probably hurt less than words. In fact, healing from a physical injury is much quicker than word injury. Our words are destructive. The, uh, and the impacts of reckless words or verbal abuse, they can have some really long-lasting psychological effects. Therapists, uh, counselors, uh, psychologists, they make a lot of money because their patients have been at the receiving end of someone speaking words to them. Our emotions are prone to injury. And so when we don't control the things we say, there's a good chance that we're going to injure somebody. And those injuries often don't heal quickly. That's why in Proverbs 15, uh, it says, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. Right, life, but a, 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 a perverse tongue. Oh, it breaks the spirit. Like it, the, what we say, it's not benign. Words they hold immense power. They breathe. They can breathe life into somebody, or they can just it can just tear them down. Now, for for those of you who are uh, gun enthusiasts, uh, for you Second Amendment folk. I say you as if I'm not one. I'm a Second Amendment guy as well, so it's all right. Hopefully we're all on the same team here. Uh, we know that there are gun safety rules. For example, we know not to point the gun towards something that we don't want to shoot. We know to keep our finger off the trigger. And the reason for these, the reason why these rules exist is because we don't want to injure someone inadvertently. So we understand that there needs to be some kind of effort to control 
handling a weapon in case we hurt somebody. The same applies to the tongue. The same applies to the, the things you say. You have to be very careful when you're going to point your words towards somebody and then pull the trigger and say something because the consequences can be really, really harmful. And so by way of analogy, our efforts for gun safety could really apply for mouth safety because it does matter the things that you say. Now, just to be clear, uh, being hurt by words because somebody said something you didn't want to hear is not what I'm talking about, right? Just because someone rebuked you or somebody said something that made you feel a certain way, that doesn't necessarily correlate with being injured or abused by someone else's words. If you're, if you're a delicate flower and your petals wilt every time somebody says something that you don't like, well, I think you need to just strengthen up a little bit. That's this is not what I'm talking about here. Obviously, fortitude is something that um, every person's got to um, consider. But, and I'm not saying that there should not be a prohibition to speak truth and love, right? So, we, you know, in our culture, we get told, please, if you say anything that my little ears don't want to hear, then you've violated some right or something. We all know what I'm talking about, right? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about cruel, mean, reckless words that scar, that hurt, that injure people. Our words, listen to this, our words are sin's greatest ally. Sin partners with your speech to get the best work done. It is one of the greatest tools of the enemy. So each day when you wake up in the morning and you go to work or you go to do all the things you've got to do and you're going to cross paths with a whole bunch of people, it's going to be the things that you say that is going to be the best outlets you have to sin. So if you want to increase sin in your life, increase your words. You'll get a lot done. In fact, in my observation, and I, and I think this is true, I didn't have time to kind of do a biblical survey on this, but I think the two main sins that the Bible talks about is sexual sin and the things we say. These are the two most insidious and pervasive aspects of how sin has an outlet in our life. In fact, I, I think in James 1, it, it underscores the, the magnitude of the things that we say. He says in verse 26, this is James, uh, Jesus' brother, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle the tongue, deceives his heart. Look at this. His religion is worthless. That's a, that puts a lot of weight behind the things you say. If you can't bridle the tongue, your religion is worthless. And then a couple of chapters later, in chapter 3 of James, he makes a theological statement about speech. For we all stumble in many ways, right? And we do. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, so if somebody can perfectly control the tongue, what's the result? He's a perfect man. Also able to bridle his whole body. Man, that's a, that's a big thing to say. Now, so knowing that, knowing how damaging the tongue is, knowing that there are pretty severe consequences for it, knowing that the more you say, probably the more damage you're doing and you're probably creating a bit of a space for sin, wouldn't it make sense to suggest that there should be a prohibition on speech for Christians? It'd probably serve us well. And then we could just take that to the next level and we could get um, a surgery where we have our tongues removed or something, right? Wouldn't that be best? It would certainly neutralize a lot of the destructive nature of what the tongue can do. Well, if we do that, it just prevents the negative impact of the tongue. The tongue can also be used and be wielded for good. Words can be constructive. Words, our speech, the things we say should honor and glorify God. That's the purpose of them. 
We don't want to misuse it. We want to use it in obedience to the Lord. So every Christian, we have a responsibility. Each of us here, we have a responsibility that our words honor God, uplift and encourage one another, that we speak truth into each other's life, that we uh, into each other's lives, and that we express love and forgiveness to one another. That's It gives a better picture of probably how we're meant to be using our tongue. That's constructive. That's good. That's honoring. In Proverbs 12, 18, um, and by the way, when when thinking about this in the past few days and just writing my thoughts out, there was just so many verses. I was saturated with verses, especially in the Proverbs, that just over and over and over again just restated the significance of controlling the tongue and the, the, the destructive nature of the tongue and the potential of the tongue, tongue just to breed, breed life into somebody. So there's so much that verses that I could bombard you with here, and I just had to pick out some randomly. So in Proverbs 12, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but... The tongue of the wise brings healing. You can say stuff to people that is so encouraging, that is so healing, that breathes life to them. So rather than using your words like a dagger or a sword thrust, as they say here, they should be deployed in such a way where it does some kind of a work in somebody else's heart that is meaningful. Maybe the best thing You want me to tell you one of the best things that you could say in nearly most situations that is going to be the most wise? The most honoring things that you can probably contribute to a conversation is your silence. That's probably the most useful thing half the time. I found, uh, because I'm the guy that tends to say things too much too quickly, right? That's me, right? And um, do you know how useful it is just to keep the gun in the holster, so to speak, and just say nothing. Jesus demonstrated that. That's what he did uh, on the, just before being crucified, when standing before the Sanhedrin. Then he stood before, before um, Pilate and, and King Herod. Oh, silence. Didn't say anything. Found it wise to keep silent. So mature faith, mature believers. If you're here this morning and you're thinking, yes, I'm mature in the Lord. I've been, I've been following the Lord for, for quite some time. Well, mature faith, it shows itself by, her, by the control of the tongue. It should, they should be used to show love, show forgiveness, encouragement, give hope. In fact, many of the spiritual gifts use the tongue. When we pray, we usually pray in the form of praying out loud. We worship the Lord with our, we just did that this morning. We worship the Lord with our tongue. And so in light of the fact that our speech and the things that we say are meant to be honoring to God, pleasing to God, to be building people up, that's, that's what God has purposed for us. It is completely unacceptable to be frivolous and reckless with it. I mean, consider, again, James uh, James has a lot to say about controlling the tongue. This is what he says in chapter 3. He says, with it, with our tongue, with our speech, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can, can a, a salt pond yield fresh water. What's happening in us as believers where we're okay, we're, we're blessing the Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We, read, we, we worship. We put our hands up in the air and we use it for God's good. We bless with it. Moments later, we destroy with it. Why is salt and fresh water coming from the same place? That is not to be. 
Now, we understand that's because of that sin nature and the, 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 the spirit that we have in us, and we've got that kind of that struggle and that tension going on. But I hope that we all consider salt water or cursing or destructive speech, I hope we recognize that that's, that's such a black eye on the goodness of God. Like this is, that, should, that should be completely an unacceptable aspect of who we are. Now, don't get me wrong. We're all, we are all struggling with this. Controlling the tongue is something, I'm preaching to myself this morning, I'm preaching to you, all of us can grow and get better at this. The prophet Isaiah, he describes an attitude towards speech that I I think we should take to heart. And in Isaiah 50, verse 4, he says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The the tongue of the learned. Some translations say the tongue of a disciple. This conveys the idea that the things that we utter are the things that we have learned through God's word. A word in season to him who is weary, that describes someone who who lifts up another person and gives them strength. And so here, Isaiah is saying, I wake up in the morning and I, I wait to hear and I listen as a disciple. And then my mouth is an extension of that. I don't just wake up and run my mouth and say stuff. I don't just wake up and my speech is just an output of my thoughts, right? He, he says right here, he, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. And that should be our desire. That should be our prayer. That when we wake up in the morning, our speech is being overseen or it, it, the, the the content of our speech is coming from the things that the Lord is speaking to us. And when we do that, we're able to give a word of season to someone who is weary. That's, uh, that should be our attitude. A little later, uh, sorry, earlier on in Isaiah, there's um, a famous passage. I'm going to read it to you here in a moment, and you'll be familiar with it. And it's just this one line he says that just got me thinking. In Isaiah chapter 6, you don't need to turn there, but do make a note of the verse in Isaiah 6. It says, in the year that King Uzziah uh, died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Okay, so Isaiah had this vision where he saw the Lord on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. You seen this? With with two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to the another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. So this is quite a scene that Isaiah is seeing. He's catching a a, a glimpse at the glory of God. And what does he say? Verse five, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's interesting that when Isaiah saw more of who God was, when he saw a picture of his holiness or when he experienced this incredible scene that he saw, one of the first things he saw were his unclean lips. The fact that he had seen the filth. 
And I think that the more that we, that we see who God is, the more that we read God's word, the more that we fixate on the things of God, the more convicted you're going to feel about your speech. If you're reckless with your speech, if you are one of those people that, and I'm not just talking about, you know, cussing or having a, a potty mouth or whatever it is we say, right? That's not cool, obviously. That's, I'm not saying, but that's not all it is. It's anything that you say, which isn't, isn't good, it isn't nice, it isn't kind, it, it's destructive by its very nature. I think the more that you are fixated on who God is, the more you're in his word and you're reading about him, he's revealing himself to you through scripture, so that's where you kind of get a sense of the nature of God the more you get to see his desire for how you conduct yourself, the more you look at it, the more it's going to highlight. It's almost like scripture. This is a horrible illustration I'm about to give, but it's like a hand comes out of your Bible with a highlighter and highlights your mouth. (laughs) That's not in my notes. Should I say that second service? Because it was a little weird, right? But I was trying to make a point. The more we see God, the more we see our unclean lips. Our speech, it's a powerful aspect of our humanness. And so in the same way that we refrain from sinning by action, in the same way that we don't walk around hitting people, the same reason why we don't walk around you know, committing a whole lot of different sins, we should have that same urgency and that same desire to be restrained and the things that we say. Our words should be an offering to God. I think sometimes we forget that the things that we say, that is an act of worship. Now I understand the challenge here. I understand that the flesh, that flesh part of you, finds a lot of satisfaction in venting and just saying stuff. I understand that in our ridiculous minds sometimes, we we conjure up some thoughts and some concepts, and we're like, oh yeah, let's say that. Well, somehow, we need to introduce um, some kind of regulation or oversight over that. Somehow, we have to um, take control of the things that we're going to say. So we're going to spend the rest of our time here this morning talking about maybe a way to do that. Let's zero in on what might be the most prominent and common way that we are reckless with our tongue. There's a whole lot of ways that we we sin with our tongue. Um, I want to to bring up the one that I think is probably the most pertinent for for the Christian. Uh, I want to give it, I want to address the example of where we are all failing. And so my second thought for here, us this morning is gossip and slander, dishonor. Not only man, but that dishonors God. Gossip and slander. For some reason, we are inclined to have the details of other people's lives on our lips, Right? And it's, it's such an unfortunate aspect of who we are that we sometimes speak poorly of one another. Gossip, gossip is to have a damaging commentary about another person. And it doesn't even matter if it's wrong or right what you're saying. If you're saying something which is destructive and it is true about the person, it doesn't make it any less gossip. Okay? Remember, I think it was Muhammad Ali. He said something along the lines of, uh, it ain't bragging if it's true. Do you remember him saying that? Yes, it is. It's still bragging. What are you talking about? Just because what you're saying is true, it is still bragging. Now, the way I figure is nobody was going to tell Muhammad Ali that he was wrong about that. (laughs) But don't think that gossip and slander and speaking of people is uh, acceptable because the content or the nature of it is truthful. That's, that's wrong. 
But it's sad, but a lot of the time, the way we speak about one another is it's not charitable, and it's typically very divisive. And, it's, and you know, we don't go out of the way to speak well of one another. I haven't had, it's not typical that someone comes up to me and says, oh, Morgan, just quickly, just wanted to, just wanted to tell you something. Just wanted to say, that, see that guy over there? That's Bill. Do you guys, do you know Bill Morgan? Well, I just want you to know that that is, he's a good man. He's got a really good heart and uh, he's been a real blessing to me. I just wanted you to know that, okay? It never happens. <laughs> Nobody, hardly ever does anybody call a special meeting with me or a phone call or a special text message where they just need to address the good qualities of someone else, right? Remember, I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about some other group of people that need to sort it out. I'm talking about all of us. We know it's wrong, and we don't feel great about it when we do it either, do we? You know when you, you say something and you're like, uh, I didn't even really mean for it to go that way, but that little speech I just had with that person turned into gossip. It doesn't even feel that good when we do it, so we kind of know. So we have this really kind of funny tension here where we're inclined to do it, but we kind of also have a disposition to not really like it and to feel icky when we're around it. So what, what inclines this behavior? There's something in us that uh, drives us to be unmeasured in our words. Proverbs 11, you're going to get another Proverb 11. It says, uh, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. So that's what we want to do, right? Right? Yeah? Isn't that our desire is to not say the thing that needs to be said? So why do people spread rumors and gossip? I was thinking about that. I've been think, I thought about why is it that I would do it? When I found myself doing it, what's, what's happening? Now, we know that there is a spiritual undercurrent to the whole thing because, as I said earlier, you know, our words, the things we say are a sin's greatest ally, right? So we kind of understand that there's a a spiritual issue at hand here. But it is worth pondering kind of the way our sin nature works and why we're inclined to do this. And to be honest, very little psychotherapy needs to go into this to figure out why we are compelled to be reckless with the things that we say. And I think sometimes it can be subconscious, but I think most of the time uh, we speak, I think we speak ill of one another sometimes, and it's just out of our own brokenness. It's really not even about them. There's something happening in us that triggers this, or prompts this part of us that feels like we need to draw attention to something else, or we need to, we need to take the eyes off us, we need to highlight someone else's issue. It's quite sad that we're like that. And if you're thinking, ah, I don't know about that. Well, we uh, we are guilty of it. There's some kind of insecurity, some kind of pride, some kind of jealousy, something that's whirling around in our heart and mind that causes us to say, well, you know, and then we talk about someone else for some reason. Sometimes we spread rumors that maybe it makes us feel included. A lot of these reasons I'm about to kind of give here, they sound so petty. And we'd love to think it's just not us, but uh, I don't know, maybe it is. But we want to feel included, we want to seem informed, right? We want to, there's a little bit of attention that we get when we share the thing that has a lot of drama behind it, but we're not in the drama. Whew, that's 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 a good commentary for you to give if you're, kind of operating out of some kind of brokenness in some way. I know that sometimes we can even feel like by um, sharing something uh, interesting, some exclusive information, that maybe that makes us interesting. We get this false sense of that, and that's not true. 
Uh, in psychology, there's a term uh, called schadenfreude, and this is used to describe someone who takes joy and, and satisfaction and the misfortune of others. Now, you don't have to re remember that term. My point of sharing it is just to let you know that there's an official condition, diagnosed condition, in people where for some reason, when some kind of misfortune happens in other people, especially if you have some kind of ill feeling towards them, there's a little bit of satisfaction and joy. So no one wants to admit this, right? I, the most common version of that, by the way, is, and where I've seen it is when there's been a divorce between two couples, one of the spouses remarries, and it falls through, and it breaks up, and they end up getting divorced. This person here, there's a little bit of joy and satisfaction, right? Or if you don't, if you don't agree with me, you're just lying to yourself and me this morning. <laughs> this is the way we are. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. But if we, the, the first step here is can we just admit that we're broken people and we run our mouth because of our own ridiculous issues? It's gossip, it's slander, and it is damaging. And if we admit it, and if we start maybe kind of identifying, the only reason I'm probably saying that is because that affected my pride. Oh, I don't like that this person complimented and spoke really well of this person because I too can do that. And you never said anything to me. So now I'm going to say something that just brings that person down just a smidge, just a little bit because of my own insecurities. That is how this whole thing plays out. I feel like you guys are just not on the same page with me and you're thinking, <laughs> man, pastor's got a lot of issues up there. <laughs> this isn't confession. I'm not sitting up here trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to, talk honestly about the way we are as people. So we're not as innocent as we would like to believe. And we, we can, we're also very good as Christians. We can disguise our gossip. Um, we can do it in a lot of ways. So the two main ways, uh, you will go and ask somebody for their advice or their opinion on a situation, which is just somebody else's circumstances. So we go to, you know, we're sitting down with a coffee with a friend and we're like, hey, just wanted your thoughts, just wanted your feelings, you know. You've probably seen this before, but you know Susie. <laughs> I've just, I've noticed Susie, uh, this is what's been happening in her life lately and she's been doing this and saying this and, you know, I love Susie and I just want to be able to minister to her. So what do you think now that I've shared all this information that you didn't need to know? <laughs> That's one way you can do it. So if you are looking to disguise your gossip, that's one way, that's one technique you can use, right? If you want another, if you want to gossip and feel better about it as well, you know the classic, right? I think you know what I'm going to say. Prayer request, right? That's the one. Hey, guys, just be praying for Susie. Uh, gather around, let's make a circle. Let's just be praying for Susie. Um, Susie is in a relationship that I don't think the Lord would approve of. So these are the ways that we... Uh, I'm trying to point to the ways that we don't see the fact that we are kind of guilty of this. And so the Bible, God's word, his instruction to us is that we're to, to uh, speak in wisdom. We're to walk in wisdom, we're to have wise decision-making, and we have to speak not as fools. We want to have kind speech. We need to remember, man, there are consequences. Like, it, it, it really does matter what you say. It does have a downstream effect. It might feel benign, but it's not. So as we kind of come to a close this morning, I want to mention just a few principles, just a few thoughts that maybe can help us to grow in this, grow in controlling the tongue. Uh, there's an, an endless list of things that we could probably touch on. I'm just going to mention four. Uh, these aren't necessarily the, the top four, but they're four things that come to mind. And I, I do want you to leave today with 
at least four thoughts, four convictions or principles that may help constrain uh, your speech. The first is we need to esteem each other highly. See, words, the things we say, it expresses your thoughts. The, The reason why you said something about someone is because that's what you think about them. Your words are just mere echoes of the thoughts that drive them. And so if you hold negative thoughts, if you hold judgments, if you have a bit of an attitude, if you have some unforgiveness, whatever it is that you've got kind of swirling around in your mind, then I guess we shouldn't be surprised that the things you say reflect that. It says in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. So I think a good place to start to try and reduce gossip and slander is think a whole lot differently about people rather than looking at them and thinking, oh, I would never do that or they always do that or whatever your judgments are. Why don't we just start thinking about them more charitably, thinking about them more kindly? Why don't we start thinking and esteeming them more than ourselves? Because if you change your heart and change your thoughts about them, you'll be less inclined to gossip about them and to talk poorly of them. If you respect and honor someone, your words will be respectful and honorable. So we should esteem each other highly. Second of all, for this, uh, I hope this would help you think about speaking recklessly, but gossip is the virtue of fools. So I don't know if you want to be that person. In Proverbs 10, verse 18, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. So when someone gossips, when you gossip, just all you just this is what you need to know. As you're saying your thing. As you're saying, oh, did you hear this about Susie? As you're doing that, just know that you're putting on a hat that says fool on it. (laughs) You're not even criticizing Susie. You're criticizing yourself. It is unbecoming. It's a self-indictment to gossip. So maybe just keep in mind that gossip is a virtue of the fool. The third point we're mentioning here is when you gossip and you don't tame the tongue, you're destroying the family of God. Now, this specifically applies to the believer, but when you tear someone down with your words, you are hurting a brother and sister in Christ. You're not hurting Susie, you're hurting a sister. I'm sorry if your name is Susie this morning. This, uh, <laughs> I should have come up with a more obscure name. But In Romans 8, 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons to whom we cry, Abba, Father. So we have all been adopted into the family of Christ. We we, we say, what, church family? We say that. So just keep in mind, when you're about to go say something, you're talking about a child of God, you're talking about a brother and sister in Christ. I think you would be a whole lot more, hopefully, controlled about the way you hurt your siblings because that's what you're doing. We're meant to be a source of support and encouragement. We're meant to be the ones that when we aren't doing well, when we are worthy of being gossiped about because we are, have done something not good, we should look to one another for help, for hope, for comfort, for encouragement, for correction, right? Not to find out that they've posted a whole blog about it on Facebook, And so we are each other's brothers and sisters. It might behoove us to stop 
speaking poorly of one another. The fourth one here I've made a note of is if we want to reduce gossip, is we should refuse to be an audience for gossip. The, the biblical prohibition against gossip and slander, it begins with not giving it a platform. Because gossip needs an audience, right? It needs somebody to kind of turn their ear, listen in, and say, yeah, yeah, keep, that's it. Keep pouring that gossip into my ears. We've got to reject it. We've got to reject gossip as it sprouts. Proverbs 26, verse 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. Yeah, so if you, if you refuse to be an audience, if you refuse to put yourselves in a situation where gossip's coming your way, you are, uh, there's no fuel. You're removing logs off the fire. And it decreases quarreling. So it's interesting, even though people are intrigued by gossip, uh, they don't like being around it. I might even add at this point that if you are a person and it seems like people don't really want to be around you, oh, I might suggest maybe People don't like being around someone that doesn't control their tongue. Even when you are fascinated by what someone's saying. I've, I've listened to gossip, and as I'm hearing it, part of me, you know, I've, they'll, they'll say something, and I'm like, wait, what? You know, and then what? And as they're saying it, I'm like, oh, oh my. You know, I, 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 turn, you know, I, I turn into... I get sucked in to the vortex. I get sucked into the drama. Like I'm watching a sitcom or something. Right? We've got to step away from this and we just can't afford to be an audience to that. In Proverbs 20, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Okay, well, what should we do? Do not associate with a simple babbler. That's, that's a better term than gossiper, right? It's more demeaning, a simple babbler. So it's prudent to disassociate yourself from one who gossips. There are so many other techniques or strategies we could use to decrease gossip and slander and our inclination to not control our tongue. And I just mentioned four because I do want you to start thinking about this. I want to provoke your thinking as to why? Why do I do it? And what, what shift in my thinking and in my understanding of, you know, who I am and who others are, what can I change where I'm not compelled, I'm not kind of magnetically drawn into that space? Well, I think it starts with what we're talking about here. I think it starts with thinking more highly about one another, realizing that anything you say that it's gossipy is just foolishness and everybody's perceiving you as a fool. I think it's it, useful to remember, oh man, I'm tearing down a brother or sister in Christ. That's useful. Oh, you know what? I'm going to make a bit of a covenant, a bit of a vow between me and the Lord to not be at the receiving end of it. I'm not going to stoke the fire. I'm tapping out and saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not receiving gossip at this time. I'm so sorry. Church, we all struggle with it. And it's okay to acknowledge it. That it's okay to say, yeah, this is an area of, of development. There are very few people that I can think about in my journeys who I would look at them and think, oh man, that person, they, they control the things they say. I've never heard, there's very few people where I can say, I don't know if I've ever heard that person say anything mean or critical. I'm not sure if I've heard that person say something that they don't need to say. There are a couple I can think of, but they're very few and far between. So we should grow. I'm going to invite the worship team up here as we come to a close. So my challenge, my encouragement for all of us, including myself, let's sanctify our speech. 
let's bring the things we say before the Lord as a sacrifice. When we talk about in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, this is your spiritual act of worship, that is including the things that come out of your mouth. Can I share a verse with you that will motivate you to refrain from misspeaking? Psalms 101 verse 5, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. So that's just in case you're wondering what God feels about it and what his plans are with it. He will destroy and he will not endure. So I don't know if that gives you a nice little kick along here to say, oh, yeah, time to clean up your act. It's, it's time for it to stop. He will not tolerate it. It is an offense to him, and we should probably expect that demise is in route the more we do this. We don't want to be divisive. We don't, we don't want to uh, sow discord among the brethren. And if I'm going off memory right now, but I think sowing discord among the brethren is one of the few things that God says he hates. Whew. You don't want to be doing one of the things that God says, oh, I hate that. Oh, well, then I'm not doing it, right? That should be our response. Let me close with this final verse. Ephesians 4, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Lord, we just want to thank you, God, that you are patient and gracious with our shortcomings. God, you have to watch your children not control their tongue, not control their speech, and it's so dishonoring. And so, God, I just pray for, for each of us here that we can grow and we can learn more about why we do these things. God, shine a light on us. Help us be so mindful and thoughtful uh, and be thoughtful about why we are tempted to dishonor you because we need to repent of this. We need to humble ourselves and learn to tame the tongue because our desire, and obviously I speak for myself and I assume on behalf, on behalf of this church that we want to be constructive, not destructive. So lead us and may we, not as we walk in wisdom, as we walk in the Spirit, may we also speak in wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, my friends, let's stand, let's close in a song.